Okay, can you all hear me a little bit better now? Okay, great. I'll stop yelling then. Um, awesome. So here we have our programmability lab, and this is located in um, San Jose, California. So here we have three different versions or generations of the lab. So basically what I'm trying to show here is that we're continuing to evolve, innovate. Let me get the mic figured out here. Awesome. OK, so we're continuing to evolve and innovate on the lab by continuing to add new. <laughs> all right, thanks for bearing with me here. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Great. OK, so this is our lab in, um, in San Jose, California. And here we have a few different generations of our lab. So we're continuing to add new devices and actually build up our lab here. And the purpose of this lab is to have users like yourselves actually go in and be able to try out new features, no, new programmable features with each release of iOS XE. So if we take a look at the most recent or current version of the lab, you can see it here. We have 30 APs, 30 9300 switches, a few uh, ISR routers, and UCS. So here, the purpose of this lab is, or why we have so many devices, is so that three users, can, 30 users, can simultaneously log in and actually be able to use this lab and go through it. And I want to talk a little bit about the automation that we have within this lab. So here, we want these 30 users to be able to go into their pods, into the lab, and try it out all at the same time. But after the lab, there's typically a lab reset process that takes quite a while, right? First, we have to understand, did all 30 users actually log in? Do we need to go to each pod and reset it? Or maybe only 25 users logged in, and we would need to only reset those. So another consideration is, what if a user didn't exactly follow the lab guide? What if they actually took a look at maybe a different feature of the lab, created a super awesome script that runs every day and deletes everything that's currently on the pod? We want to make sure that doesn't happen. So how we overcome this is to have an automated process to reset our labs. And what we do is each lab has a jump host that users can SSH into to gain access to all of the devices. So say our switches, our APs, you log into a virtual machine first to be able to access all the other devices. And <clears throat> excuse me, once you uh, use this VM, what we do is we have 30 of these, right? 30 pods, 30 users. Every time we want to reset the lab, instead of going into each individual virtual machine and resetting them, we delete every virtual machine that exists, right? We delete them and we recreate them from a golden image of a new virtual machine. And that one has the starting config, the starting setup that we would want a user to have before they actually started the lab. So we completely wipe out all of our VMs, and we recreate them from this new image. And we have a similar process for our devices. So we use zero-touch provisioning. And if you're unfamiliar with this, basically, when you first get a device, you can plug it into your network, right? And then it will know to go out to some server and grab usually a Python file to go out and configure itself for the day zero configuration. And so we go through a similar process in our lab as well. So every time we want to reset the lab, we have all of our devices go through the zero touch provisioning or ZTP process. And at first, we started to do this after every event, right? After every time we have users logging in, we want to reset this process. But then we realized, hey, we don't want to actually have to physically remember to go hit the reset button to trigger all of these items to happen to reset our, both VMs and our devices. So what we do instead is we have uh, on a timed schedule, so every night around midnight to 2 AM, we kick off this process. So if anyone throughout the day has gone into the lab, made any configuration changes, changed anything in the VMs, 
we automatically know that the next day it will be reset, it will be a clean version of the lab, and anyone can log into any of the pods and all should be ready to go. Next, I want to talk about a slightly different lab. So this one is located in Vancouver, Canada. And here we're using Ansible scripting to actually go in and configure BGP eVPN. Now I won't get into too much of the details of BGP in this session, but ultimately the point here is we're using Ansible as a tooling to go out and configure our devices. Now I'm going to talk about a different lab. So this is called the Switching Innovations Lab. And the purpose of this one is so that users like yourselves can better understand what's happening in the newest, latest, greatest switches. So if you haven't seen, we actually have a lab this week where you can go into the Switching Innovation Lab and actually understand what's happening here and get hands-on experience. So I encourage you to go to that ses session later this week if you're able. But today we're not going to talk about what happens in that session. We're going to talk again a little bit about helping users go throughout this experience. So in this lab, we don't have the same setup where we have, say, the 30 pods, the VMs that we destroy and recreate in the reset process. Instead, this is a slightly more manual process. So each user logs in using RDP. And we have the limitation that only one user can be logged in at a time. So this makes sense, right? One user is using a pod at a time. That's all fine. But what if someone finds an issue, right? There's something wrong, and they need help. Typically, the process would be to ask a lab admin or a TA, someone in the lab, exper in the lab um, to help them with that experience. And what we may realize is that maybe something wasn't reset properly. For example, in one of the labs, we're working with telemetry. So we have open source, model-driven telemetry. We're looking at a TIG stack, Telegraph, Influx, and Grafana. And this is all within a Docker container. And so what if that Docker container isn't running? It's not started yet. This would be a huge issue for the user, right? Because they would see, OK, things aren't working. Things aren't running as expected. And so to overcome the issue of, say, the user realizing there's a problem and then needing the lab guide, the lab admin to log into their pod, right, take it over for a few minutes, and then return it to them once they've resolved the issue. To save time and efficiency, we've created a reverse tunnel. And so this reverse tunnel allows us to actually see what's happening. Is this Docker container running on each of the individual pods? And then we'll be able to know and go ahead and troubleshoot or turn on, right? start running the Docker container um, <clears throat> before the user may even realize that it's an issue. So you can kind of see the setup that we have here. First, we have an example of one pod. Here we're going to talk about pod 6. So we have a Linux VM. We're able to SSH into it using this port, which again is associated with the specific pod, pod 6. And we're able to access all of this from a separate virtual machine, right? So we don't have to disturb the user. We don't have to RDP into their pod. And we can already see what's happening. So here's an example of the scripts that we're actually using. And the main thing to call out here is we can see that we're actually checking to see if the Docker container is running. And we're going to go ahead and run the Docker container itself. Then we get the output from the pod to know, OK, yes, this Docker container is running. Everything is on track for the user. Now, I'm not going to get into too many of the details here. But we do work with crypto keys, and that's what makes this reverse tunnel possible. So now let's talk about infrastructure, automation, and APIs. So really, the purpose of this section is to show you or expose you to different resources that you may or may not be aware of. And we won't go into the details because we don't have the time today. But if you would like to chat more about these, please let me know after this session and in the WebEx space. I'm happy to chat with you more there. So first, I want to talk about VMware and some automation with ESXi. So we have this option, get VM host. And this is really important to know, OK, where do we have additional resources? Or where might it be appropriate to start running a new process if we want to add something into our lab? 
So we can use this Git VM host to better understand how to allot our resources. Next, I want to chat a little bit about Power CLI. So again, we're working with VMware. This is a CLI, a command line uh, tool. And this works with Windows PowerShell. So here we're able to automate things with vSphere and vCloud and better um, create options to, to automate our reset processes or other opportunities there. Next, I want to talk slightly about monitoring. So here we're using Telegraph and the REST API. And we have these pre-generated VMware dashboards. This, so this is telling us about the health of ESXi, so say the CPU, the memory. We can visualize all of this to better understand how things are working in our network. Next, we can invoke the VM script, so using PowerShell bash or batch. So this invoke VM script is a Power CLI applet, right? So this is one way that we can also automate these processes. Again, I didn't have time to go too deep into the details, but if you'd like to learn more, we have examples on GitHub, and you can check them out here. So next, I want to talk about WebEx bots, notifications, and we can dive a little bit deeper into a demo. So here, I was talking about the process with the programmability lab, right? We have these 30 pods. We have the virtual machines that we tear down each day and recreate. And we also have the zero-touch provisioning process. So we're going in and resetting all of our iOS XE devices. Now, programmability and automation is great, but it's only great when we know that it works. So this is where WebEx notifications or the verification aspect comes in. So we want to make sure that these pods are actually being reset. We want to make sure that everything is working as expected for our users so we can, with confidence, say, yes, at the beginning of each day after the reset process happened throughout the night, we know that the pod is ready to go and that all the lab sections are reset for our user. So how do we do that? We can work with WebEx bots. So I have some links here to some documentation about WebEx bots and how you can actually create one. But this process is actually pretty simple. So you have two main requirements. One is you need a WebEx bot. And once you create one, you'll be automatically generated with a token or an ID associated with that bot. So if you're unfamiliar, WebEx bots function really similarly to, say, if another user was in a WebEx space with you, right? This bot will send out automated messages. You can write Python scripts to make it do pretty much whatever you need it to do. In this case, again, we want it to tell us, yes, our pods have been updated. They've gone through the ZTP process, and they're ready to go. Now, secondly, we need a destination, right? Where is this WebEx space, or where do we want to be posting these messages? And this we can find. Um, it's essentially the room ID, so you can create a new WebEx space and add your bot to it. Or if you have a WebEx space that already exists, you can add your bot to that too and post notifications or messages from the bot in an existing space. So I have some details here about how you can go about and actually find the room ID or that destination that you're looking for. But um, know that all those details are here and we've gone through this process in our labs and I'm happy to chat with you more about how you can do it in yours as well. So overall, we have this Python file and as you may be able to tell, it's a pretty simple file, right? Not too many lines. And we have our two requirements up at the top. So um, we have our room ID, which is where we're going to post the notification. And we have our bearer token or our bot ID. So who's going to be sending the message? And the main point to note here is this box in blue. And this is the message that we want our bot to post. So for now, we're just going to send a generic message. Yes, our, um, our pods have been reset. And we'll actually see that message appear in a WebEx space. So don't trust my word for it. Let's actually take a look at it together.
So I'm just logging into one of our pods here. So I'll send a message in our WebEx space just so that we can see, okay, this was sent at 10, 18 a.m. And we should be able to see that a new message will be sent when we actually run um, this Python script that I was just showing before. So let's see here. Logging into my pod. Oh, you can't see. Thank you. Yep, I'm just switching over the displays here. Thanks for bearing with me. Oops. All right, we can see if we'll actually be able to log into the pod here. But essentially, we can see that the script is here, right? We're calling this the WebEx notifications.py file. And within it, we're going through and we have everything that was in the previous screenshot before. So we have our room ID defined. We have our bearer token, which again, this is the bot, the uni uh, unique identifier for the bot that we've created. And we have a test message. So as you can see, um, we're actually able to get the test message. Um, this is a test message from the pod Python application. This is what we get from our bot over here in our WebEx space. So we've defined that this is the space where we actually have added our bot. You can see we've called it the Panda bot here. And it's sending us these notifications, right? We got one this morning. We also have been getting messages from all 30 of our pods as they each come up, and again, this happens sort of uh, in the middle of the, the night for us. So with that, I will wrap up here and open it up to questions if there are any. I would love to chat with you after this session. So thank you for attending.